Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to Glitch Bottle, the podcast where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. I'm Alexander F., and today, what an esoteric honor and an esoteric treat to welcome back to the show author, poet, and essayist Peter Mark Adams to talk about the Egyptian mystery traditions. And I know, listeners, you might be asking yourself, what are mystery cults? What do they do? What are the Egyptian mysteries in particular? How were they practiced? What was involved? But also, how do many Western esoteric conceptions of the Egyptian mystery traditions actually map onto their history? Are they accurate? What do they get right? What do they not get right? Well, Peter Mark Adams is the perfect person to ask about all of these things. Peter is, among many other things, an author, a poet, an essayist specializing in the ethnography and visuality of ritual, sacred landscape, esotericism, consciousness, and healing. And Peter is no stranger to the podcast, having shared his incredible research into topics spanning the Sola Busca Taroki, the Hagia Sophia in Turkey, as well as the incredible healing work that Peter and, of course, his partner, Kenzie, who leads the amazing healing work and practice every day to help others. In this episode, we're so excited because Peter's going to unravel the mystery of mystery cults for us and talk about fresh insights into the Egyptian mysteries and also share about his upcoming mystery tradition course that's coming up in 2024. So a big thanks to also every Glitch Bottle patron and supporter for your excellent questions for Peter as well. And with all that being said, Peter Mark Adams, thank you just so, so much for coming back on the Glitch Bottle podcast today. Oh, it's a pleasure, Alex. Oh, it was a pleasure to talk with you. Delighted to be back on. Oh, Peter, the 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 honor is mine. Um, I was just saying before the podcast, I had to hit the record button because there's so many things that when talking to you, it's like, oh, ask Peter these 10,000 things, but I will <laughs> restrain myself. Um, but Peter, you are so busy. You're always working on things. And I think the best first question would be, you've delved into so many topics as we were talking about the Sola Busca Taroki, Mistai, the Hagia Sophia, obviously your amazing partner, Kenzie, with the healing field. So given this menagerie of interests that you are always investigating, what made you decide to specifically explore the mystery traditions and the Egyptian mystery traditions? Yeah, this this is no uh, new fascination. I, in fact, I would say it's in esoteric terms, ancient Egypt is my earliest fascination. Uh, I think it was around the age of seven or eight. Um, there was this beautiful Times um, weekend supplement, which had all this gorgeous photography of, of all the treasures of Tutankhamun in it. Uh, I was totally blown away by this. And it became an obsession for me. And the, the amazing thing is that within eight or nine months of seeing those images, I was standing in front of them in Cairo in the museum. And that that's extraordinary. I was a, this was back way back 1963 or 64. Um, I was able to go inside the pyramid, you know, and climb up right into the, the central chamber. Um so you can imagine at that age, this this had a substantial impact, <laughs> you know, and, and it's retained a kind of talismanic attraction for me. Okay. Now, in relationship to my work, essentially what I've been doing is tracing an initiatic tradition back from the Renaissance to its earliest origins. So after dealing with the broadly, broadly Hellenic mysteries, and, and I, I categorize the solar busker ritual process as essentially Hellenic, okay? Even though it, it, its context is, is like, you know, the Renaissance elite, nevertheless, they're enacting essentially Hellenic ritual processes brought from Byzantium to the Italian city-states in, in the early 15th century. So I'm, I'm drawn back from them to, to look at... Um, the Villa of the Mysteries, for instance, the Dionysian 
uh, initiatic tradition within an elite Roman context, but nevertheless, still, it's a, it's a Hellenic mystery initiatory tradition that we're looking at in Mystai. The Hagia Sophia was a more sophisticated project in as much as the um, what what I defined as as its architectural and decorative design is essentially a projection in three dimensions of the core of the Eleusinian mystery tradition, okay, via uh, its Athenian recension. So essentially, as the sanctuary was sacked and closed down at the end of the fourth century, the initiatic tradition was transferred into Athens and carried forward at least for a century, if not more. And from there, it, 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 it spawned in Alexandria, where many of the students who'd studied in Athens under Proclus were from Alexandria. So they returned there after studying. And in the great school of Hor Apollo, uh, Hor Apollo were an Egyptian family who retained their native paganism. They were worshippers of Isis and ran this school, a kind of eclectic mystery college, so that housed this tradition. Um, and from there, it was passed on to the designers of the Hagia Sophia, who then embodied its core precepts in the architectural and decorative design. So essentially, we touched on some of the major mystery traditions moving back in time. So it's kind of logical for me that the next step is to look at Egypt. And Egypt has been like a fount for the entire Hellenistic tradition. The problem, however, is that whilst for the Hellenic mystery traditions, we have a substantial body of architectural, archaeological, and, and even firsthand te te testimonies to, so to speak, reconstruct their ritual process from. Okay, so... In in the solar busco, we have a ritual process depicted, just as we have one depicted in in Pompey's Villa of the Mysteries. You know, in in Proclus's writing, we have we have his first hand testimony about the experience of mystery initiation, and and we can further amplify this this material if we bring in ethnographically related cross-cultural material from like the higher yoga tantras of the Indo-Tibetan tradition, which are also mystery-like. Okay, And we can begin to create a very clear conception about the types of process that are being enacted and the results that they give. So when I turn to look at the Egyptological material, um, I was faced with a real challenge, I have to say. Because, I mean, for, for a long time, uh, Egyptologists have claimed that there were no mystery traditions in Egypt, for instance. And it's only been in the past three or four decades that there's been an acknowledgement that, um, yes, indeed, there were mystery traditions, but we don't know anything about them, really. So I, I, I want to move the, the discussion on from this point because I believe that, in fact, there's very rich material embedded in the Egyptology, which gives a very clear understanding of what the Egyptian mysteries actually were, how they were enacted, the specific ritual processes involved, and the metaphysics underlying them. And that's how we come to <laughs> the presence situation uh peter i am always blown away because <laughs> your research your insights really do push the needle forward and they push the conversation forward and with the ethnographically infused uh, observations that you have and the context it is it is so important and i and i think um we're definitely going to get into academia and evolution. And there are so many different facets that I, I know listeners will really appreciate your thoughts on. Before we get there, um, there's always a lot of terms, Peter, that are, of course, yeah. thrown around. And we have a listener question for you from Nathan James. And Nathan is asking and saying, hi, Peter. I love when you come back on Glitch Bottle. 
Nathan, I totally agree with you, by the way. Um, my question is, many people, myself included, uh, Nathan says, I am guilty, have thrown around many similar sounding terms as if they were the same thing. Therefore, in this discussion about Egyptian mystery traditions, could you, Peter, please briefly explain the key differences between the following terms, mystery cult, mystery tradition, and mystery right. Thank you so much, Peter. Sincerely, Nathan. Thank you, Nathan. What a great question. <laughs> okay, let's, let's get into this. First, let me say what I take a mystery initiation to be, okay? Because that's like the, the touchstone for this. It is an introduction by a lineage holder to a specific deity. Okay, And by introduction, I mean the ability to induce a voluntary, temporary state of possession by that deity. Okay, That's what we're dealing with. Mystery initiation is nothing other than that. And therefore, immediately with the introduction of the notion of possession, you can connect the mysteries right back through to the earliest shamanic practices as depicted in the rock art of the upper Paleolithic 35,000 years ago. This, this is the depth of tradition we're looking at. The mysteries were more elaborated forms of the most primitive possession cults that we see depicted on the cave, uh, you know, deep in cave systems and in rock shelters in the remote places. Okay. So it has that kind of continuity. But turning now to Nathan's questions, a mystery cult is any organized body of lineage holding priests and priestesses who can confer a valid initiation. Okay. So a cult is normally localized. That's to say it will have a sanctuary certainly in the case of Egypt and in the most of the Hellenic mysteries, they were sanctuary based. In the case of the Hellenic mysteries, they were also tightly connected with a polis, with, with a city state. Okay. And since the polis were democratic in, in, in a very primitive sense, democratic, that meant that the population had access to the mystery initiation and this is certainly the case with like Eleusis. so people would have a ceremonial procession from the Eleusinion in athens all the way down to the sanctuary of Eleusis. Um, and it was a procession that took all day it was punctuated by a uh, song and dance at, at, at key um key parts of the landscape, because we're talking now about a continuous sacred landscape, okay, which was, so in a sense, you reenact an ancestral walk by doing this to arrive at the sanctuary, and then you would enter the sanctuary, and again, you're in a landscape, a sacred landscape that reenacts the mystery of Demeter and Persephone which is then acted out. And finally, the initiation takes place within that context. So that, that's a mystery cult, you know, sanctuary-based. In the case of Pompeii, it's a mystery cult organized by elite Roman family in a farm, a large farm villa with its estate, okay? So the continuity is provided essentially by the family in that context rather than the state itself. Okay, it was Dionysian rites were never part of uh, Roman state religion. They were always peripheral. Okay, um, and finally, the, there's the case where you have itinerant initiators. So they're they're part of a mystery cult in as much as they they hold a valid valid lineage, which needed to be, I think, at least three generations of initiating priest or priestess to be accepted as conferring a valid initiation. So uh, that's that's mystery cult. It's, it's organized around a specific deity, in other words. A mystery tradition 
is the continuing practice of mystery initiation for a deity, whether it's conferred at sanctuaries or by itinerant initiators over a considerable period of time. And, and we're talking here like a thousand years, you know, that would be the kind of minimum. Certainly the, the side of Atelusus has like a thousand years behind it. Okay, that's a tradition. But it, it's not exclusive to Eleusis. The same initiations can take place all over the Near East or similar initiations, as long as they're initiations for a common deity, they're within the tradition. So the, the different, then a cult is located, a tradition is not located, so to speak. And for, uh, finally, uh, a mystery rite is a specific ritual process employed to confer initiation. Broadly, they had two stages, uh, preparation, which was largely purification and dedication, and the initiation itself. Um, the ritual process is always modeled on a key aspect of the deity's myth cycle. And that, that, that is critically important. So that, you know, the, the ritualists embody the role of that deity and the deity's entourage. So in the case of the mysteries of Dionysus, it's the hieros, hieros gamos of Dionysus and Ariadne that forms the centerpiece, so to speak, of the ritual process. But that hieros gamos is not a physical act. It is the act of possession by the deity that is taking place. Okay, that, that's an important qualifier. So that the initiate initiatrix conveys the energy to the initiate who becomes possessed by the deity, and therefore, in a sense, is the deity for a short period of time. They experience that ecstatic uh, unfolding of awareness, of consciousness, of, of a really global consciousness which changes fundamentally, it, it relativizes the role of the persona. But we'll we'll come to that later, perhaps. <laughs> so th they're the three terms. So we have um, a cult based at a location. We have a tradition, which is that deity's initiatory cults, wherever they are. And we have the mystery rite itself, the specific ritual process modeled on key aspects of the deity's um, myth cycle. So, in, for instance, Near East, Dionysus is just one example of a Near Eastern vegetation deity. Okay, he is known by as Liber by the Romans. He was known as, as Tammuz or Adonis or Attis or Telepenu in, in the Hittite tradition, Luwian tradition. So these are, the reason we can be more insightful about the Egyptian mysteries is that the Near Eastern corpus of vegetation rite mystery initiation shares so many commonalities. Okay, and we can bring that that because we we actually have the right celebrating the vegetation deity, not only in 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 Greek but in in Hittite. So we can make direct comparisons of the kind of core liturgy used in mystery initiation across these many cultures. And so when we start making these connections, the whole thing kind of comes to life as a process, an understandable process, and why it should be that the vegetation deity is, is such a, an excellent template upon which to build a mystery initiatory tradition because the death and rebirth is integral to the myth cycle so any part of that myth cycle that is then ritualized becomes a valid vehicle for the uh, initiatory process anyway i'm talking too much here alex <laughs> let's get back to you uh no no sir please <laughs> please keep going this is I really appreciate that. I'm sure the listeners do, especially with this rich context. And as, as you say, these observations, this cross pollination, the similarities go back, you know, thousands and thousands of years. You think of 
Demuz, Tammuz, you know, going back to three, four thousand BC. Um, Peter, one of the nodes, one of the historical sources that that you also discuss as well is the Greek historian um, Herodotus, who you touched on earlier. And when it comes to observing these commonalities, can you share with us? This was in in the mid 400s BCE, yeah. um, wh- who was Herodotus and what observations did Herodotus make that sparked interest in the Egyptian mystery cult? Okay. Um, a little context here. Whereas the Egyptians appear to have enjoyed an almost uninterrupted cultural continuum from let's say the pre-dynastic period through to the end of the d- dynasties when Alexander invaded the country in 300 or something. Um, those like 4,000 years, and I mean, I'm saying 4,000 years, but of course there was something before the pre-dynastic period and we could go right back into Neolithics, you know, okay. So let's say they, they enjoyed a cultural continuity, which was quite exceptional in the context of the Near East. The Greeks, on the other hand, as with the Anatolians, had suffered major disruptions, uh, one around 2100 BC and a second one around 1100. And that second one destroyed the palace culture of the entire Near East. Okay, so that essentially there were like three centuries of darkness in which civilization needed to re re kick, actually. It was like almost a cold start. So that around 800 BC, all of a sudden, um, we start to see the emergence of a distinctly Hellenic presence again. And uh, this was largely blind to the Mycenaean period that had preceded it three or 400 years before. Okay, so 800, 700 BC. So we have an extensive Greek um, colonization of the Aegean and Anatolian, west coast of Anatolia through this period. And Herodotus appears to have been a native Anatolian who adopted a Greek persona, as so many of them did, because it was the dominant culture of the time. Um, And he's called the first historian. Essentially, history as a discipline didn't exist at this time, of course. But he was a he was a documenter of customs. You know, everything was of interest to him. And he kind of uncritically dumped all of this stuff. You know, a lot of it is is fascinating material about his visit to Egypt. And a lot of it is 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 like his guesses about where, where it originated. Okay. So you have this mixture. Um, but his observations about the enactment of the Egyptian mysteries are interesting because he observed similarities between the rites that he was witnessing, which were almost certainly the rites of Osiris, and the rites that he knew from his homeland, which were almost certainly those of Dionysus. So uh, th- this common theme of the vegetation deity, of course, connects the two. Um, now, here's the thing. He thought that, therefore, the Greek rites, because Egypt was far older in its continuity, must have been derived from the Egyptian rites. Um, He's almost certainly wrong (laughs) in that respect, okay? Uh, He was right about the similarities, but he was wrong about the origins because the, the mystery rites of a vegetation deity had long been integral part of this this whole area the whole of the near east that's to say the other thing he was probably misleading us about he hadn't actually seen the mystery rites now to understand this point we have to understand that herodotus coming from a polis based democratic social structure and political structure was now in a theocratic state. And that meant um, the mystery rites were not partaken of by the population. This is absolutely essential point here. 
they were not, so to speak, a spiritual initiation for everyone, which was the Hellenic concept. They were specifically engineered to connect the ruler to the creator deity and thereby allow an infusion of, of revitalizing energy to the land and its people. Okay, this is this is a far more religious magical context than we're used to seeing in any later age. In that sense, the Egyptians had a far more uh, primitive organizational structure. So you you have a ruler under the creator deity who becomes possessed by the deity. He actually becomes possessed by the ka. And the car, in this case, is intimately connected to the lineage of ruler pharaohs from the earliest times. So he ceases to be a person. He becomes a kind of divinity in his own right. And, and this, this ritual, this birth ritual, for instance, took place in Karnak in the, in the Temple of Luxor. You become possessed by the influx of the energy, which was the car of rulership as guided by Amun. And in this respect, the, the pharaoh ceased to be a person. But they became the, the trapdoor, the gateway, the portal through which now the heka, heka, the, the revitalizing energy could flow through into the society and its people. And it would, you know, for the fertility of the land, the people and social and political harmony. And this is a really radically different concept of mystery initiation than what most of us have. This is not a participatory model. Okay. But the outcome is fully participatory because the ritual is being done for the sake of the entire community. So, the enactment of the ritual itself involves the most senior priests and priestesses of the cult, for instance, of Amun during that period, which was an extensive period in, in Egyptian history, by the way. And those priests and priestesses would have been drawn from the highest echelons of Egyptian society. They would literally be the brothers, sister, cousins of the pharaoh. So there was kind of no, <laughs> there was no light between the ruling family and this initiatory tradition. And then underneath this, this, this caste, it's better to think of them as a, as, as a spiritual caste, would be a body of priests and priestesses. Uh, and and towards the bottom, you would have specialists in various things like divination or exorcism, uh, people who knew the liturgies very well. And, and this priesthood worked on a part-time basis. Again, it's, it's not often grasped that they served three months of each year in the temple system. The other nine months, they go back to their communities where they would have you know, wife and family or, or husband and kids. Um, and they'd serve in the community, often farming or whatever, but also uh, bringing the speciality that they had from their temple education to the community. So in this way, there was a kind of flow. So because of this, what, what you have is a very curious feature of Egyptian culture, whereby the rights the hieratic rites of the great temples could be enacted in miniature. Okay. They could be, for instance, inscribed on papyri. And the act of inscribing them was a magical act. And therefore the papyri were magical objects that emanated the force of the ritual. But then you could have that ritual when you were buried you couldn't afford <laughs> a huge temple in the valley of the kings or the queens, okay, with, with the walls, you know. 
inscribed and painted by by the best artists of the day in a, in a massive ritual process. But you can have your papyrus with at least some stages of this ritual inscribed on it, and you'd be buried with that, and therefore the papyrus would enact that ritual for you or can, and continue to, to exert that force. So you have this process of miniaturization because of the hieratic um, nature of the society, the way of diffusing, so to speak, the current was not by bringing everyone in, but by spinning off miniaturized elements of it. And of course, this is how the uh, Greek magical papyri get started. Okay, they are spin offs from the hieratic tradition. <laughs> So you'll see elements in there which are true of the mystery rites, for instance, or of the funeral rites. Okay, there's that connectivity via miniaturization. Anyway, so <laughs> we get back to Herodotus now. <laughs> I know. I, I hope that that's that's a reasonable explanation for the relationship of Herodotus to the mystery rites. Of course, everything I've just said has only emerged after, what, two centuries of Egyptological research. So for most people, they're still kind of stuck with what Herodotus said. But it needs this amplification in order to provide a context. Because And there's a further level of obfuscation, good word, uh, obfuscation over this because of course alexander the great conquered egypt in the fourth century and upon his death the um rulership was grabbed by the ptolemies who were macedonians they were not even egyptians but they affected egyptian dress and pharaonic tradition and it was them who started to develop a mystery cult around the figure of isis which hadn't existed before Okay, now this is important stuff, because for most of the Hel Hellenic tradition and through into the Renaissance and then into the Western esoteric tradition, Isis has been a central figure. But Isis wasn't a central figure in terms of having a cult, a sanctuary and a mystery initiatory tradition until the Ptolemies created it which is not to say it was invalid. It was just a much later addition. Isis had been a central figure to mystery initiation for millennia, but she was not herself the figure of initiation. Okay. She's not like, you know, initiation into Amun or into Hathor or any of the great gods. She was a facilitator in that tradition an essential ritual component in enacting the rituals. Now under the Ptolemies, she got full-blown cult of her own, and it became massively popular in the Greco-Roman world. So you have this proliferation of uh, the rites of Isis uh, right through into the Roman, Roman period, and therefore, because of the Romans, spread all over the place, small temples of Isis, would pop up. So that's a little context around that. What we're trying to do now is join together the understanding that most people have about uh, the Egyptian mysteries with their reality and how, you know, we need to be far more nuanced in our understanding because by being nuanced, we can dig into it and really begin to grapple with what they were doing and why they were doing it. And therefore, the, the ritual process can be made to live again. Peter, you are, as usual, forcing me to look down and take so many notes because I just I am just blown away by the excellent context with with Heka and this revitalizing energy and this kind of royal organization, but also this democratization, this mini mini miniaturization, as you say, that flows into the villages and the surrounding towns. And before we get to Peter, the excellent context about not only what is a specific right, what did a specific right look like, but also how the Western quote unquote mind and Western esoteric conception of the Egyptian mystery 
rights may or may not have gotten everything correct. Before we get there, can you, Peter, share some context about the Egyptian esoteric beliefs or elements that are involved in these rites. So for example, some of the key elements might be, and people might've heard these terms about the Egyptian afterlife, the Egyptian concept of reincarnation, the anatomy of the soul, how Egyptians thought about the soul is, can you share some of the broad strokes about those elements? Anything you want listeners to know? Yeah, this, this is jumping in a very deep water now. Um, the reason for that is most times when people talk about these things, they, for instance, have a list of uh, the subtle anatomy in the Egyptian worldview, for instance, has a car, a bar, a shoe, and a mar, and all of these elements. Um, And the problem is we then give them all little titles. So the car is this, the bar is that. And by doing so, We think we've clarified something. But the more you dwell on a word word like spirit, (laughs) the more immaterial it becomes. And the problem here is that the Egyptian concepts have all been derived from ritual contexts. This is really, really important. The stuff we have has been taken out of temples and... um, from funerary rites that were in their essence performative texts. That's to say they they not only um, depicted the ritual, they were themselves ritual elements. Okay. Now, the shift from normal awareness to ritual awareness is substantial one. And I've probably talked about this extensively before, but in the intensive conditions of efficacious rather than theatrical ritual, consciousness undergoes a profound shift. And for instance, we you know we know that for instance on uh, Proclus has written about the uh, the influx of chthonic deities as the moment of the appearance of the deity comes closer during mystery initiation. And just how disturbing this is. So, for instance, the entire entourage of the deity starts flowing through the ritual space. And the the deity manifests itself, often as a light, but very often, and this is true in ancient Egypt, in the Hellenic mysteries, and in the higher yoga tantra today, in fully formed form. Okay? Okay. The deity is actually there, and the energy is incredibly intense. And this is why, you know, the characteristic of the mysteries, they always said, is is to have seen and worshipped at close at hand the deities. Now, this is unimaginable from any common sense perspective. Okay, It is simply out there. And and the fact that it is so outre is, is that, the distinction between normal space and ritual space when it is efficacious when it's when it's properly generated is at such a variance okay and, and we know that this this is in the ethnographic record i just mentioned one example uh, bruce grindle's example of uh, attending a um, ritual divination for the death of of a king in West Africa. And he wasn't invited to this. He he kind of snuck in the back. He wasn't meant, he shouldn't have been there. Uh, And and he talks about how, as the ritual progressed, he experienced increasingly powerful sensations of energy in his own body, rippling up through the spine. And and as they did so, uh, his, his consciousness began to transform. He had intense feelings of dread, and fear coming up. And then finally, there was like a snapping sound uh, <laughs> where his spine joined the, the skull. And at that, there was it was like his vision suddenly sprung open and he could see the ritualist dancing and chanting in the center of space. And long flows of light were emanating from their hands and dancing over the corpse of the king's drummer there. And 
all of a sudden the drummer got off the buyer the 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 corpse started dancing in the space and then started playing a drum reeling around okay so after this ritual he got very ill indeed and needed a healing ritual himself but the the point here is that this is in the ethnographic record it's just one of many accounts that are in the scientific record of western science many of these these kinds of experience have been undergone by anthropologists but have not documented them because they're so outre okay so our problem then is to make sense of this what he was observing happening is impossible from any common sense perspective nevertheless it's what he experienced within the ritual space mm -hmm. i'm sure if you were observing that ritual space from far enough away you wouldn't see anything like this but once you become part of that energy field the possession is contagious and again we have accounts of this from people like maya deren in the context of voodoo that observing voodoo ritual from so to speak the periphery of it, of it you can start to feel yourself drawn into it start feeling yourself being possessed by an entity so what i'm trying to get to is that this list of words that most of us have probably seen time time and again in books about egypt the car is this the bar is that so on and so forth um are shorn from a ritual context that we no longer have access to and therefore to just like pop a definition on the end of each one so the bar is the soul the car is the spirit doesn't actually inform you of anything okay so we we need to go back and fundamentally rethink about the ritual context in which these terms have from which they've arisen and in which they have meaning so we know that intensive ritual processes to do with funerals and to do with initiations often call upon the ancestors the ancestors are a spectral presence and we we find, have this experience ourselves in healing because the ritual space i mean healing also invokes a ritual space it has an its intensity and the ancestral forces can be present in that i've talked extensively about constellation therapy in the book the power of the healing field as a matrix that allows the ancestral spirits to engage and to seek healing Okay, so that's the kind of context we need to be thinking about when we talk about car, the the regal car, the ruler's car. Is not just spirit. It's the embodiment of the ancestral lineage of all the rulers of Egypt going back in time to the beginning. Okay, Heka is the original revitalizing energy. Heka is created by or pre-exists the creator deity itself. The creator deity creates the gods from Heka. So the gods themselves are Heka, except they're not like an electric current that you switch on and off. These are personhoods. This is a sentient web of being that we're dealing with. So when we talk about the ruler becoming possessed by the ruler car, he becomes a deity on that level. Okay. And therefore, what is the relationship of the soul of the human to this divine being? Okay. And what is the process that they go through in life and through death? These are massive, massive questions. And that's why we have things like the uh, Book of Doors, the, you know, the, the, the Book of Nuit. These are attempts to engage with the metaphysics of death and rebirth. 
but you can't do it with a set of simple instru instructions with sim simple definitions. You're dealing with a web of meaning here. And at the very core, you have metaphysics. And on the outer edges of this web, you have actual esoteric experience arising in intense ritual contexts. Okay. So what we're attempting to do is recontextualize this material. And that, that is a far, far deeper and more involved question. So I'm sorry, I'm not answering your question. <laughs> no, you you are. <laughs> this is this is what we, we are actually dealing with. I I love the context because look, I'm I'm just as guilty, Peter, of throwing around these terms and thinking that one could have an easy one-liner, you know, encyclopedic definition. And what you're saying is this is not only incredibly um contextual, there's so many layers, so many veils of mystery that you are attempting to in your research connect the dots, you know, uh, kind of peel back some of the veils. And so to that point, and you've already touched on this, um, you are sharing about the metaphysical foundations of these rituals and what defines an Egyptian ritual practice. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, the uh, elements that you've shared so far are things like the ruler who is engaging in the ritual, tapping into the ancestral lineage, that incredible gravity and power, that's one element of the of an Egyptian ritualistic mystery rite practice. The other one uh, would be, as you say, not only having the lineage, the ancestral lineage, but also becoming possessed, a temporary possession by the deity that the right is surrounded in that's that's another element a third element is in this possession and in this accentuation of the ancestral lineage there is a flow that happens that distills itself out into the general populace something that is not Hellenic because the Hellenic is much more democratized. It's everybody yeah. come in, we'll benefit. This is from the top yeah. down, but there is a diffusion there. Okay, so we have the ancestral embodiment, the temporary possession, the diffusion. What are what are some of the other key elements of an Egyptian uh mystery rite that that you would like people to know about? Because those three alone, as you say, are just so powerful just to connect the dots with. Yeah, I mean the the other important thing here is to understand this notion of rebirth you know the fact that the vegetation deity um, provides the, the ground zero for all these rites um, means that the notion of rebirth is absolutely inherent to the entire process so i mean we have a quote here from herodotus the egyptians were the first to teach that the human soul is immortal and at death the body enters into other living beings and then uh, comes to birth so on so herodotus recognized this as an integral part of the egyptian metaphysical worldview but it wasn't peculiar just to the egyptians again he, he's ascribing to them primacy because of the vast cultural continuity of, of their society and culture. But actually, it was it was common to any of the um, mystery deities. It was absolutely the ground zero of uh, mystery initiation. So, yeah, the, the concept of rebirth brings in the concept of judgment and spiritual evolution. You know, they, they kind of pulled in in the train. What is the cycle for? Um, how does one affect the cycle? How does initiation, which is possession by the deity and therefore joining, in a sense, the entourage of that deity for all time, affect the cycle? Okay. Um, and I, I think the answer is clear, is that, is that the ruler is a ruler... Um, by spiritual right, that's to say, having been possessed by this ruler car, they are so thoroughly integrated into the entourage of creator deity and rulership, they will never get out of that. That's an implication of this, this model. 
Now, the Egyptians appear to have had a concept of completion, that there was a form of spiritual body which would forever go into the West, so to speak. And therefore, there seems to be a latent concept of emancipation within this system. Okay, And I, I've certainly seen that with... Um, it's quite clear Plato talks openly about it in I think in the the Phaedrus, but he talks about reaching this peak experience and then saying, well, having done that, what is one's responsibility? Well, it's clear it's not to hang about in a state of enlightenment. It's to seek rebirth and to get about the tasks, the spiritual task that embodiment brings about it's more difficult to see this kind of understanding when you have such a hierarchical theocratic uh, context to work with but i nevertheless think that deep within the metaphysics there's an idea like that although the process of of rebirth uh, seems to take place within a very tight circle it's never ne nevertheless directed towards a proper use of the revitalizing energy. Okay, so this this figure of Mart in Egypt, you know, the judgment of the soul in in the various um, funerary rituals, okay, and and the presence of of Mart and Thoth, all speak to the presence of a higher spiritual order underpinning the entire process. So Peter, given all of this rich context, given the observations, whether it's Herodotus, Plato, the Ptolemaic influences, everything that you've been tracing out, can you share with us about this, these doubts that modern scholarship might have on the historical authenticity of the Egyptian mystery traditions why is there this academic not consternation but but why do academic sources question some of that especially as you say given in recent decades um all of this new evidence coming to light well, i think historically it's been questioned because ritual is not the um or the way that ritual is handled in modern anthropology is as a political and social and cultural artifact. It's a way of organizing and, and controlling a society. Uh, it has its gender politics. And all of these social aspects of ritual have been to the forefront of uh, all of this. So the notion of ritual having an esoteric dimension is not acceptable in academia to this day. They acknowledge that the Egyptians had an esoteric life, but woe betide you if you should ever uh, attempt to explore that. <laughs> Certainly academically, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's the third rail again. The example I gave just earlier of Bruce Grindle and the uh, death divination ritual that he attended has been on the ethnograph part of the ethnographic record now for what 40, 50 years, I, I don't know, a good while. And yet you won't find anyone referring to it. You know, so we're still stuck with this. And, and therefore, my task is to attempt to bring a cross-cultural and ethnographic light to bear on this ritual process from an esoteric perspective. Okay, So, you know, my own personal experience of, of giving initiation for the last 25 years and I've been involved with these things for around half a century now. I try and bring that as well as the cross-cultural ethnographic data to bear on the ritual processes that we have from the funerary uh, documents and from temples such as the Temple of Luxor. And so, Pete, oh, please. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say I, I can't amplify all of this in the course of our, our talk. It, it's too involved. But I want to make that the core subject matter of the course that I'll run in January. Okay. 
it's too involved and we need to be able to cite specific images and sources to make sense of this because I believe the ritual process of mystery initiation in the Egyptian tradition is embedded within the larger context of funerary rites and temple rites. But we need to, to work on the iconography and metaphysics to bring that out. And then just as, as, as with the, uh, the basic concepts like Kabar and so on, we need to contextualize it as a ritual process, okay? This is a far uh, deeper process than than I can just handle right now, okay? But that that is what I'm aiming towards. That's what the course is for. Absolutely, Peter. And okay. listeners, check out the podcast and video description for a link where you can find out more information and sign up for this awesome course that Peter has in early 2024, which is just going to go in, in multiple modules, just go really in depth into multiple facets of, of the Egyptian mystery rites and context. It's, it's much, much more in depth as, as you said, Peter, than what we can get into here. Um, well, let, let me just briefly yes, say, please. Alex, um, if I could, it, it's a three part. First part, we will go into in depth into the actual experience of mystery initiation, ancient and modern. So we have the experiential uh, first hand data to hand that that's kind of you know benchmark for me secondly we the second module will will look at the evolution of western ideas about mystery initiation you know because there's a story there as well you know when Ficino took the letters of iamblichus and porphyry and relabeled them the egyptian mysteries it like you know, it provoked a whole tradition that went on into right through into the golden dawn, you know, and especially Florence Farr and the Sphere group working and 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 on from there. So there's a, a chunk of content there which is important for people engaged with Western esotericism to have clarity about. So the module two, we'll deal with that, and then we'll deal with the metaphysical concepts. Third module, we'll look at the ritual process as well as we can, drawn from the iconographies of the temples and uh, funerary texts. And, and, you know, some of these funerary texts have 70 plus separate ritual elements within them. So what I'm doing is working through those and drawing out the ones that seem to have a cross-cultural resonance in the tradition of the vegetation deities and including modern rites such as the higher yoga tantra. So we're looking for these ethnographic continuities in order to isolate distinct elements that would be common to mystery initiation. Okay. So th that's essentially the program uh, I'm working on, and hopefully we'll deliver that in second, third, and fourth week of January. I think is, is the rough schedule right now. The, there'll be more information later on when it's firmed up. So that is excellent, Peter. Okay. Um, I, I again, Just listeners, to tie that one off a little. <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> Listeners, please, please check out the podcast and video descriptions as well for the direct link so that you can sign up uh, for Peter's amazing course. And Peter, something you just touched on, uh, we have so many listeners who are um, you know, researchers and also practitioners of Western esoteric traditions. And as you just said, there is the actual mystery tradition from the Egyptian tradition, the historical Egyptian mystery rites. And then there's the Western conception of these rites. And these twain uh, sometimes don't always match up, or or there might be a little bit of a different uh, apprehension versus the historical context. And to that point, Peter, we have a listener question for you mm. from Paul Ames. And Paul is mm. asking and saying, hi, Peter. I'm a member of a Western magical lodge, which incorporates elements 
of Egyptian mythology. This got me thinking, Paul says, what do Western esoteric lodges get right? And what do they get wrong about their conception of the Egyptian mystery traditions? How do Europeans in the last several centuries think about the Egyptian mystery rites? Thank you, Peter. Okay, so that that's a huge subject, isn't it? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not going to talk about right or wrong here. Um, what I can refer to is the fact that the mystery rites, both Hellenic and Egyptian, had a much higher purpose. So the Hellenic rites were seen, as Cicero said, as underpinning civilization. And equally... What I've said just now about the theocratic nature of the Egyptian rites was that it underpinned the stability, harmony, and fertility of the land and the people. And this is huge stuff. So um, rather than a kind of lower instrumentalism, that's to say, I want to get enlightened, whatever that means, the rights of higher initiation were um, an alignment with higher order beings, okay, predicated on a service that was consonant with notions of spiritual evolution. Okay, so the extent to which modern orders and movements or groups or personal practices align with that then you're in alignment with what they were attempting to do with the uh, initiation rites. Okay. Where probably you, you have a, a, a problem is in inducing the quality of possession that a lineage holding priest or priestess would have been able to bring to bear on the ritual process itself. Okay. And that, that was very intense. Okay. So, in order to safely undergo initiation at that level, and, and this is still available today through the higher yoga tantra of the, the Indo-Tibetan tradition, by the way, you need to prepare yourself. And essentially, you need to dedicate yourself to that purpose. Because once the rite takes place, you have a place within the entourage of the deity. And you will have sworn solemn oaths to forsake certain behaviors and to engage in other behaviors. Okay. And, and this is this is profoundly karmic stuff. And it's not to be taken lightly. So forget about having an experience of a God inside. <laughs> <laughs> until you're ready to align yourself um, with, a, with a hierarchy of higher order beings busy about the spiritual evolution of species and whole orders of sentient beings. That's the scale of this, okay? They're not particularly interested in you in the sense that you have certain ambitions, you want to own certain things or achieve certain things in life. Okay, so there's a disconnect between what I call instrumental magical practices and mystery practices, which are the abnegation of, of, of the persona's needs, drives, desires, and so on. So, you know, uh, this is not to answer the question directly. I can't say what a lodge is doing well or not well. It's not... It's not something within my purview. All I can do is try and clarify how I've understood the tradition as a continuing uh, a continuing tradition from the Upper Paleolithic to today, by the way, so that it's like gone hand in hand with uh, human social and cultural and spiritual evolution for millennia. And I'm sure many of us who are engaged with this stuff today have been engaged with it for many lifetimes. Okay. So that's the kind of perspective I have on it. Um, and I'm not sure if that answers your question or not, Paul. <laughs> I hope it brings some clarity. Absolutely. Well, 
I can't speak for Paul, but I, I I can Peter for me that I I it, that really clarifies it with the context about it's it's less about saying is this historically a historically correct replication of an Egyptian mystery right and more is it successfully tapping into the currents of uh, voluntary possession or in the currents of ancestral accentuations and and tapping into those same forces. And I guess, Peter, the next logical question, something you just touched on, is about evolution. So can you share about how do these mystery rites fit into or express our own human evolutionary history? What is what is this continuum that listeners right now listening to you will will find themselves on, connected both to the past and to the future? Yeah, I, I mean the spiritual problem is that it exists in outposts and islands across the globe. And the problem is joining them up. Okay. This, this is really simplifying stuff. Okay. So as we work on these things, we are attempting to cleanse and purify ourselves to be a better channel and to connect up with other islands of advanced spiritual thought, okay? And this is kind of the crawling process we're engaged in with a lot of ups and downs. You know, it's snakes and ladders. And sometimes it seems like there's more snakes to slide down than there are ladders to climb up, okay? There are periods of history like that. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that all of it points towards a evolutionary growth beyond the persona um so that the the moment of god consciousness that comes about as a result of initiation becomes a far more durable and permanent part of our uh, day-to-day persona so we're, we're less likely to lose track of that sense of god consciousness within ourselves and to bring that consciousness to our each and every day transaction. This is a big, big, big challenge. You know, in challenging times, it becomes even more challenging. That's absolutely yeah. But I think this is what we're, we're called upon to do uh, within an initiatory tradition. And Peter, these initiatory traditions, they pose a direct challenge to the materialistic worldview that many people hold. Um, even, you know, I'm sure there might be some listeners out there who maybe they're reading a grimoire and they're in, in, engaging with spirits for a specific material benefit, which of course, if you look at the Greco-Egyptian magical papyri, material benefits, damaging an enemy, health, love, the, these things are always from a practical, magical perspective applicable. However, can you share about how the mystery writes and this incredibly consciousness transmuting way are a direct challenge to a materialistic worldview that that's purely materialism yeah i mean when i think about it um probably in terms of our consciousness and connection to a multi-dimensional reality of which nat nature is the outer garment um the last like three or four hundred years with the scientific and technological revolution that's taken place has, has massively shifted the focus of our awareness away from that holistic engagement with a multidimensional reality to a much narrower one. Okay. Okay. And in, in the process, it has led to the, to the growth of what, what I would call an instrumental attitude to reality and this this instrumentalism that has led us to 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 run roughshod over nature and other species okay and as a result of that we are now like choking on our own pollution okay so there's a there's a serious issue of survival um, as a species, as many species are going out of existence in this mass, you know, die-off. Um, 
So at what point do we start taking responsibility for this on an individual and on a community basis and doing whatever we can to correct the balance? Uh, I'm suggesting that one step in this is to step back from an instrumental engagement with reality. Okay, And the only way we can effectively do that is by relativizing the persona and its insistent demands okay, for fulfillment. And one path to that is, is through um, mastering certain healing techniques. So you can begin to deal with the underlying emotional issues that are the drivers of consumption. Okay that need to always feed yourself with another something or other to feel whole. So that, that needs to heal that, that that's an individual work. Everyone should be undertaking and also absorbing the, the wider context within which your desires play out. So there's a consequence for consuming a lot of red meat all the time or well, I don't want to go further, but you need to examine your lifestyle and to what extent is it driven by a evolutionary spiritual perspective and to what extent is it self-medicating to deal with uh, an excess of negative emotional charge, okay? So that that's, that's a play for every one of us to be engaged with. So... The larger perspective on this, as I said, is, is to recover that golden age when the multidimensional nature of reality and of our participation with all sentient life forms, the garment of nature, as I called it, um, is restored. So we're, we're after the restoration of the, the golden age, in essence. I don't think this spiritual task has ever been any different, to be honest. You'll find resonance of it throughout the Hellenistic uh, oeuvre, and I believe that the you know the the Western world where Hathor lives amongst the reeds is also an image of this return to a perfected state. But it takes all of us to get there. You know, it's not just one person's individual process. It's the process we all do as we start to link up the islands and isolated elements of spirituality and try and change the, the larger vibration within which we're living. That's a kind of answer, Alex. <laughs> That's absolutely fantastic answer. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm reminded of the quote from the going back to the Victorian era, but the great Oscar Wilde, who said, all art is useless, right? Which jars some people, but that there should not be this instrumentalism to art and there should not be this instrumentalism, you know, this, how can I use this? And that's so fascinating, Peter, that, you know, for people who consider themselves esotericists, that instrumentalism isn't simply materialism that can carry over to a an anti-spiritual evolutionary approach that can be detrimental to yourself and to your community would that be somewhat fair to yeah summarize that yeah yeah i mean the scope of the challenge we're faced with is absolutely enormous right now so it's it, it's kind of in your face almost <laughs> you need to change your life <laughs> but all of us I don't, I include myself in that, of course. <laughs> well, Peter, one of the things that you are constantly doing for me, in addition to blowing my mind and really talking about the importance of our individual actions and how they affect our community and nature and service, I know those are, are big um, themes. And I love that. I love that phrase, the garment of nature as well. One of the things that, that you, you did is introduced me to the French anthropologist Philippe Descola. Um, can you share who who is Descola and why is his work on concepts involving animism, uh, totemism, and analogism important to the discussion of the Egyptian mystery rites? Can you connect some dots for us? Yeah, indeed. Um, I, I think the thing about 
Descola is, of course, he's a professional anthropologist, uh, done enormously influential work. Um, and what he, what is it? I mean, if you look at the history of anthropology, it's gone through a number of, of so to speak, theoretical phases, you know, um, one of the more prominent was the French school of structuralism, for instance, Levi Strauss. But what Descola seems to have done is to relocate the discourse uh, away from uh, European um, theoretical considerations back towards the communities themselves. So that in his book, you know, Beyond Nature, I think it's called, he sets up a series of uh, concepts that he believes are generically true of pre-modern societies and cultures and which best, best capture the way in which um, they function on, on a kind of optimal way. So when I looked at these, I, I, I was pretty clear that this is a excellent description of pre-modern culture and therefore it should be applicable to the egyptian uh, situation so he has these like three um his view is essentially holistic and animistic and therefore it for me that ticks the boxes <laughs> okay um his way of articulating the world as I envisage the Egyptians would have seen it. So it's like seeing the world through Egyptian eyes. Uh, first of all, animism, that's to say the, it's often described as a shared interiority or personhood. So that that is a cross species attribution of personhood. So immediately, you know, you're you're like kicking down all the doors here. Okay. Shared personhood on all levels. Uh, recognition of sentience. I mean, the recognition of animal sentience is still problematic today, which is absolutely amazing. There are lobbies against recognizing animals as sentient beings, even today. It just shows you how far we have to go. <laughs> And for the Egyptians, I think animism is one aspect. We need to amplify that, though, with the notion of vitalism. Okay, so we talked earlier about the revitalizing energy of Heka, the universal energy. So sentience or personhood rests on a field of energy as well. It's an important element in understanding the Egyptian perspective. Another one is totemism and the way this manifests, I think, in, in Egyptian uh, culture is is the fact that all the deities also have an animal persona. So that there's a, and, and not only that, all the major deities have a particular town or city, which is seen as their residence. So there's, you know, the the deities are connected to specific energies, qualities, functions, and locations, which have nothing to do with their original form. So there's a different type of relationship at work here, which is best described as totemism. Okay, it's so it's it's kind of a, almost a vertical connectivity, but through many different types of. Uh, energies, qualities, functions, locations, forms, human and animal. They're all related by a shared quality. And, and that's the essence of totemism. So, you you know, it's, you can contrast it with animism, which kind of just embraces everything. Everything has a personhood. The totemism is saying, well, there's an organization of these, this personhood according to certain common qualities. And finally, in fact, the scholar, I think, uh, defines four. But the, the first three are important. The third one is analogism. Um, and the best way to understand that in the Egyptian context 
is they have this notion of a hierarchical relation uh, from a creator deity or a common source in Heka, so that the creator deity creates the deities from Heka. So they're imbued with Heka, so to speak. And the creator deities create everything else. So that also has a portion of Heka. And therefore, right down to the, you know, a common pebble on the beach, there's this vast continuity which is connected by analogy, so to speak. It's <laughs> it's difficult to express these, but it is, it's an emanation from a common source and a hierarchical relationship running through things. And that's why, for instance, the Egyptian, for instance, one of the, 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 the papyrus of Ani, which is in the British Museum, it's one of the um, texts that Wallace Budge uh, translated, I think, 1895, and therefore it became key source material for the Golden Dawn. It's the, of course, Egyptian book of going forth by day, one of the be most beautiful illustrations of that process. That itself, uh, through analogism, is a force emanating and working on reality because the processes it depicts are ritual processes. And at some level, those ritual processes were actually enacted. And the enactment brought in energies from the deities who were depicted in the ritual, who were embodied by the ritualists at the time, possibly wearing animal masks. And as such, we're representing the deities who were um, specialized rays or elements of the creator deity and the original source of all energies. <laughs> so it's, it's a very extreme form of uh, holistic vision. And, and so, you know, animism and totemism and analogism kind of capture this holistically. So th that's why this notion of of reality as a garment of a of a multidimensional reality behind it, okay, is like brought a brought to the front through Descola's categorization, helps us to make it very specific, and then look for Egyptian elements in their belief system and rituals and metaphysics that embody these concepts and we find that they are in fact there so we've now got three great lenses for looking into and understanding the egyptian worldview or looking through egyptian eyes again after so many millennia have passed that is so lovely peter what what beautiful context and i really hope the listeners appreciate that as much as i do because it really talking about vitalism it really infuses you know these uh, what were, as you say, decades, centuries ago, perhaps very cryptic texts and rituals into the new uh, context, new light and everything that you're sharing, which is so, so lovely. And this this kind of begs the question too, Peter, um, yeah. what does it mean to reconstruct, quote unquote, these rites? Is it even possible to historically replicate how the rites were executed? Or as you say, maybe it's it's less about you know, this is a correct way and this is not, but are you tapping into the currents, the same currents that the ancient Egyptians were tapping into? Can you just share about this whole idea about reconstructing a right? Okay. Let me um, share a story then, uh, which I probably have sh done before. So I for <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> I've forgotten if I shared it before with you. Um, I was once drawn along to see this guy, Tom Kenyon, who I had thought of as a new age practitioner of some kind. I knew nothing about him whatsoever. I was like dragged along there. And the, I was told he works with these forces, these beings called the Hathors, you know, which struck me as really odd at the time. <laughs> okay. So what I experienced was I, I, I went over there and we were sitting in this like amphitheater not a big audience, 50, 60 people. And Tom was on the apron of the stage. He was just sitting there and he starts singing. Uh, and he has like this eight octave voice. It's absolutely phenomenal. Um, 
so it's most ethereal and spiritual sound, I have to say. And as I was watching him do this, all of a sudden on the apron around him, these tall columns of light formed like half a dozen, six or seven. I, I don't know how many, but I was like seeing them as an overlay. Okay, so I was seeing everything as per normal. And then this overlay of tall columns of light around him. And then slowly they, they drifted off the apron and came up through the amphitheater and one passed right through me and disappeared. I thought, well, that's strange. <laughs> because it, it, it didn't have any particular uh, vibration. So I was seeing it in a very pure form, but one that was only interacting at the most minimal level. And clearly... Nobody else has seen had seen them, or or if they had, it, because somebody in the audience at the end of the session asked Tom, you know, about these Hathors, you know, how do they manifest? You know, what do you see when he says, well, when they manifest, it's always a tall column of light. Okay, so I got the verification that they were there. Uh, Tom has built this extensive relationship with them and he kind of channels their, their thoughts and ideas, which are very much aligned with what I've been saying today, by the way. <laughs> it's all, none of this stuff is new. None of this stuff is original. And yes, we're always repeating the same thing. Yeah. Um, but nevertheless, they were presences. And they obviously engage with a certain quality of energy that he can bring to the process so that the song becomes a kind of purificatory mechanism that allows them to manifest in a ritual space that obviously the song generates. So there's very ancient precedence for all of this, actually, even though it's taking place in a modern New Age context. Um, it's tapping into something which is very deep and profound in the human sp uh, experience. Um, so when you, you talk about getting in touch with this stuff again, the question I ask is, have you done the foundational work in yourself and in having a devotional attitude? Because the energies you're seeking to invoke or evoke um, are sentient beings. And if they're lower order beings, are you treating them respectfully? And if they're higher order beings, are you treating them respectfully? Um, is your energy sufficient, sufficiently purified to make the connection so that you become aware of these presences because we're not talking about traveling distances here they don't have to come to you from another star system okay from the point of view of reality it's it's almost like it's flat all the dimensions are interwoven Okay, so the question is whether these beings want to engage with you or not, and whether you're in a situation where um, you could be amenable to their energy and amenable as a, you know, something that they would spend the time and effort to engage with. Because most of us and most beings, I believe, in the universe are engaged with something. And the extent to which they're spiritually committed, they'll be uh, engaged even more so in that because all the other stuff is not worth it. So these beings must have the most engaged <laughs> lifestyles imaginable in terms of what it is that they need to achieve. Um, and these are the real questions we need to be asking ourselves. It's not a question of... Um, you know, some kind of uh, experience to be had. That is not an attractive proposition for any busy person. Um, you want to know that the people you're engaging with, the time you're investing is well spent, uh, that it is making a difference. And I think that on the, on the front of mystery initiations and the invocation of deities, you know, these, these these are the questions that need to be right up front. You know, 
your purpose needs to be congruent with their nature and your personal development and purification and clarification of intent needs to be on the same level. And that being so, I mean, if Tom can invoke these beings in like five minutes because of his own dedication to that energy, to what it's trying to achieve, then I don't see why anyone shouldn't be able to do so. Uh, that is so lovely, Peter. You you took the question right out of my mouth, which is what are the best ways that you would advise one to approach or engage in these mystery traditions are there general precepts that you would have and it sounds like correct me if i'm wrong that obviously it's have you done the work the hard work on yourself in terms of healing are you when you're engaging with these entities or these rites are you doing it from a position of esoteric instrumentalism where what can i get out of it what can these beings do for me or are you doing it from an aspect of vitalism and receptivity are you are you actually allowing these the spirits, the beings to engage as opposed to approaching it with a, I'm going to get what I think I need from this. Would that be somewhat fair? Yeah. Let, let me just add one thing that may help to clarify that. Um, this is about co-creation. Okay. So whatever it is those beings bring to reality, they are looking for agents who will work with them to embody those 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 principles okay it's about it's about agency here co-creation and agency that that's really what it's about the purification and so on of the self means that you'll have a clearer vision and understanding it won't be so blurred okay so either you won't you won't register their presence, or if you do register their presence, it'll be transient, it'll be blurred, the message will be unclear. And the other thing is the co-creation is an ongoing process. It's not a one-off. Okay, so they're looking for engagement, um, and they're looking for what you can bring to the table because it's serious stuff. It's 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 the essence of co-creating a better reality and a better future that that that's in essence what we're busy with in all spiritual practices so if you're aligned on all these fronts whether you see them or not you're going to feel their presence you're going to get their support and who knows maybe one day they'll manifest themselves to you in a form um, that you, you can really appreciate but the, the important thing is that you're doing the work. Alignment yes. comes with that. It's incredibly valuable, uh, Peter. Such wonderful wisdom. And um, I, I, I know that we will make sure listeners check out the uh, link below in the podcast and video descriptions for more insights into Peter's uh, class that's happening in uh, early 2024. Uh Peter, too, I, I definitely would love to chat about the you know upcoming projects and things because you're always working on 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 things as well. But we do have some uh, just final questions uh, for you from okay. the listeners on the Egyptian mystery tradition, and uh, one of them's from Jibril, who is asking, and I believe you touched on this earlier, Peter. But if there's anything else you'd like to add, uh, Peter, I'm sure this will be discussed, but. Uh, do we know specific individuals who experienced these Egyptian mystery rites and wrote about them? It seems no one shared details from Eleusis. Were similar requirements of silence also present in Egypt? Yeah, um, I think we clarified that in the sense that the Egyptian mystery rites had a public portion, but then the actual initiation process took place in the temple. And it was restricted to the ruler, the uh, immediate family members who were the priesthood of that particular deity, um, and and some other functionaries. So it was not really something that the public ever engaged with, as far as we know. Okay, so we don't have, we can't have first-hand testimony uh, in that context. In, in regard to the rites of Eleusis, and I covered this in the book, The Hagia Sophia, Sanctum of Kronos, um, 
its decorative and architectural design were directly inspired by people who had been initiates of Eleusis. And in the person of Proclus uh, in Athens in, in, in the fifth century, we have an initiate who's spoken about the moment of initiation. So we actually have firsthand testimony uh, in relation to the initiatory experience of Eleusis. We have that. Um, and as I said, you know, he talks about how initially the initiates, some of them are really frightened um, by the eruption of energies that come with the initiatory crux, so to speak, um, the influx of entities, and the the presence of the deity itself is awesome. So... You know, although the ex he says for those who can kind of gather themselves, in other words, they have prepared themselves properly for the ritual. Um, it's an awesome experience. I think uh, in in the first module of of the mystery traditions, uh, the Egyptian mysteries that we'll be doing, we're going to look at these first hand accounts. Uh, and not just from Eleusis, but also from the uh, higher yoga tantra, some of the uh, modern experience of the initiatory moment. Excellent. Well, listeners, please uh, check out the links below and we'll make sure to share that as well. Um, Peter, too, I, I, I know that in addition to this just constellation of context and research and insights, uh, what I'm getting from our years of chatting is the way that your own consciousness works is you're always working on something. You're always thinking about something. Um, so in addition to all of this, um, can you share with us about some recent publications and, and research and other publications in 2024, perhaps some Saturnine themed publications that will be also coming in the coming months? Yeah. Um, the, there's one available from, well, it's open for pre-order um, and available from Scarlet Imprint in probably a week's time, probably mid-November. It's called Two Esoteric Tarot. Uh, and it it's a conversation with Christophe Ponce, who has done extensive work on the um, imagery of the Tarot de Marseille tradition. And he locates it very specifically in the orbit of Marcelio Ficino. Okay, so that that, that is a fascinating uh, area for anyone interested in the tarot. From my side, it's been an opportunity for me to, so to speak, revisit the solar busker, but on a higher um, orbit, let's say. So I could reflect on the game of Saturn text and think about the deck from a more expansive perspective. So this conversation like shifts between Christophe and myself, he, he's talking mainly about Tara de Marseille. I'm talking about solar busker and, and like contextualizing the whole thing. So that, it, that that'll be a highly illustrated text from Scarlet in print. Um, and it'll be shipping in, in just a week or so. So the, there's one. Um, I'm working on a new book for Scarlet in print, hopefully the Egyptian mysteries, epiphanies of the gods. I don't know when that will be published, but uh, that that that's like in the background uh, project. Um, March the 3rd online lecture. Uh, this is like $8 for anyone who's interested. Invoking the Saturnian current in Renaissance Italy, the occult power of the Renaissance elite. Okay, how to identify the deck's various layers of meaning, the method of encryption and decryption employed, the origin, stages, and outcomes of the ritual process embodied within it, and the intimations of elite familial belief in descent from the Nephilim the offspring of the angelic watchers. Oh, that uh, that event is open. Um, it's on Morbid Anatomy website. We'll put a link uh, for all of this stuff uh, 
Alex. So, yeah, eight dollars. What a great value. <laughs> so that that that'll be like definitive on Solar Busker uh, from a ritual uh, elite perspective. Um, I've written an extended essay which constitutes the foreword to Dara Mason's forthcoming Song of the Dark Man, Father of Witched, Witches, Lord of the Crossroads, forthcoming from Inner Traditions this August. And again, that that's I think it's on Amazon, it's on Inner Traditions website. That that book is uh, open for pre-order. Uh, it's it's a really interesting book from my perspective. I wrote the foreword. Uh, Dara Mason has, has, has the book in two parts. First part deals with all of the folklore related to the dark man. The second part deals with contactees. It's a series of experienced people who actually, uh, whether intended or unintended, <laughs> <laughs> found themselves in the presence of the dark man. Uh, so that's very interesting. You've got a kind of ascending scale of experiences. The final one, I think, is is with David Beth uh, from his tradition of Voodoo and the um, experience and working with the dark man of his tradition, Master Leonard. That could be very interesting. So that's a that's a fascinating text. I was delighted to be invited to uh, to provide the foreword to that. Um, what else have we got on? I also have a new text in development, which will be called The Cult of Saturn. Uh, I hope it appears late in 2024 from Theon Publishing. So as you say, busy, busy. <laughs> so Peter, you have nothing going on is what I'm no, hearing, no, right? There's just, just lazy about, you know. Right, right. I mean, just, just a nice, you know, uh, beverage and reclining on on some you know pavilion overlooking uh the sea and yes yes of course um that is wonderful and with your works uh Derek Mason's work uh we will make sure to link to all of those below so listeners please check out uh the links below peter i i know we have uh, a uh brief after show for podcast supporters as well but as we wrap up the main podcast what is there anything else you would like to leave listeners with about the Egyptian mystery rites? Of course, your upcoming course, but anything about the traditions, the mystery rites, the Egyptian context, anything at all that you'd like to leave listeners with? No, at, at this stage, really, I've said um, what I wanted to say, Alex. Okay. Everything is there. Um, I think it, it, it's like it's packaged, it's accessible. And um, I, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity you've provided for me to to talk about these things. It's, you know, you're doing a great service. So thank you very much. Oh, my goodness. That's uh, well, Peter, the honor is certainly mine. And, and I very, very much appreciate you taking the time. Um, author, researcher, scholar, essayist, poet, healer, along with his wonderful partner, Kenzie, of course. Uh, Peter Mark Adams. Peter, thank you so much for uh, sharing your own wisdom on the Egyptian mystery traditions today. Really, really appreciate you very much. Thank you, Alex. Thank you.